angry ever again. I've been deep in depression for the past several months and I've only just started trying to fix my life again. And I don't really have the fortitude to do reviews again unless it's for something really, really special. But I just don't feel like mustering that much energy for something that really won't appeal to people. Well, why not ease back in? Find your new groove. Maybe review something you actually like. You think that'll work? I may be just an old hat-wearing pony, but if I learn anything from doing this longer than you have, sometimes it's best to talk about stuff that makes you happy. You could be critical without being critical. Okay, but what would I even talk about? Who knows? Inspiration can be found in the most innocent and unlikeliest of places. Could it be? Hey everyone, I'm Sebastian from Cinemagin and Reviews. How do you describe pure unbridled joy? Well, if you were to ask me that question back in May of last year, I would have told you that there's no such thing. These past several months have been some of the toughest I've ever had to put up with for reasons I was unable to convey honestly to even those closest to me out of embarrassment and shame. I was in a state of perpetual suffering and depression while desperately trying to claw myself out of the miserable situation I put myself under due to circumstances that grew out of my control. Long story short, I felt miserable every waking moment of the last several months and felt alone if not for the help of my close friends who, without any exaggeration, helped keep me alive. Even after the year ended, things didn't get any better, as during the middle of January, I was the victim of several hacks that resulted in my personal information getting compromised and at risk of being stolen by people who would realize the hilarious irony that they'd be stealing nothing from an account belonging to a man riddled in massive debt. You dumb fuck! To say what happened during 2023 as a whole was a traumatic experience is really putting it mildly. And if I can be truly honest, I felt myself slipping with every waking moment until things changed in late July. To that point, I felt myself lost and hopeless with no end in sight to the suffering. At this point, even my motivation for doing this, these videos, working on my channel, everything that I loved to do up until this point, all of that was gone and I felt that there was no end in sight to my infernal suffering. I truly did feel that at this moment, I think it would be easier if I could just give up entirely on doing all of this. Until 
I remember a very important lesson that I learned in one of the unlikeliest places ever to go for advice in times of turmoil. The world of One Piece. It's no secret that One Piece has left its mark on animation and literature for decades, either for its awesome action, wonderful humor, colorful art style, or over-the-top shonen energy that puts even Naruto and Bleach to shame. But rarely if ever do you hear casual fans talk about how serious and sad things can get in this story, with almost every single member of the Straw Hat Pirates having to endure a personal tragedy that would have been too much for any real-world person to handle. Yet despite their pain, suffering, and hardships, they all find ways to either crawl out of it or get stronger as a result from the experience, for better or worse. And they did it all together, as friends, as a family, and as the greatest pirate crew to sail into the Grand Line. During this time, as I rewatched the original first saga, I kept telling myself the same thing. If Luffy, Zoro, Nami, Usopp and Sanji can go through all of the bullshit that they went through and still find the strength to keep fighting to accomplish their dreams, then there is no excuse for me to give up so easily even if things get tough. I was not prepared to let my captain down by giving up so easily just because things went wrong, and as such, I kept fighting until I got things back in order for myself, and now, while things aren't exactly perfect, I can say with utmost confidence that everything from here on in is smooth sailing, as they say. Hey look, I made a pun. <laughs> I made a nautical pun, huh? Boo! Asshole. So, I made it very clear that I was no longer interested in doing reviews of any sort here on this channel. For as fun as they are, I realized that I am way better at doing video essays than I am reviews. But I'm gonna make an exception for just this once, because the live action adaptation of One Piece came out at just the right time for me, and I have so much to say about it, and damn it if I'm not gonna sit here and monetize my happiness rather than my suffering. I'm not kidding either. This series has helped me during this very difficult time in my life, and it's only fitting that I give it the proper video that it deserves. So, priorities be damned, this isn't just a review, it's something bigger and more important. So grab your swords, raise the anchor, keep Zoro away from whatever map or compass he comes across, and let us set sail for the Grand Line and go searching for the One Piece, the treasure that will make all of our dreams come true. Yo! I made a huge mistake, Purloin. It is an age of crime, scum, and villainy. A world where pirates rule the high seas and the world government is on the job trying to rid the world of their filth. When they're not busy profiting off of the very pirates they claim to be fighting against, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Our story begins during the execution of Gold Roger, the king of the pirates. Having achieved riches beyond one's wildest dreams, he stands by his public not as a prisoner, but as a royal in his coronation. A king facing death in the face with a shade-eating grin and an epic final declaration. Free yourselves! Take to the seas! My treasure is yours to find! Thus, a new age of piracy begins, as pirates from all across the four seas set sail to find the greatest treasure the world has ever seen. Or not seen, because many of us will be dead before the treasure can be found. What a very depressing thought. Many have tried, many have failed. For to find the One Piece, you first have to set sail into the treacherous Grand Line, otherwise known by many as the Pirate Graveyard. Only a fool with a death wish would stupidly sail towards this treacherous stretch of ocean filled with villains, unknown terrors, and the dreaded sea beasts. You'd have to be a complete and total simpleton to go in unprepared, with no plan, no sense of direction, no crew, and no ship whatsoever. But who'd be dumb enough to sail for the Grand Line without even so much as a goddamn map? Find the One Piece, and become KING OF THE PIRATES! This young imbecile with a straw hat is Monkey D. Luffy, a kid with a huge appetite and a simple dream, to find the One Piece and become the next King of the Pirates. Having grown up admiring some of the bravest pirates he's ever met, he wishes to grow and live out the legacy that Gold Roger left behind and make a name for himself to stand beside the heroes he's idolized since he was young. His journey, however, will be treacherous and dangerous, not helped by the fact that he has eaten a devil fruit, a mysterious fruit that grants its wielder powers at the cost of their ability to swim, as to eat one of these fruits will leave the wielder cursed by the very ocean itself. Thankfully, he will not have to endure this journey by himself, thanks to the help of the friends he makes along the way. 
Rowan Noah Zoro, a sword-wielding bounty hunter who dreams of becoming the world's greatest swordsman, Nami, a beautiful cat burglar who dreams of drawing a map of the entire world, Usopp, a cowardly marksman with countless stories to tell who dreams of becoming a great warrior of the sea, and last but not least, the thirst trap of the sea, Sanji, a handsome chef who dreams of finding the elusive All Blue, a corner of the ocean where all four seas converge. All five of them must learn to work together and get past their own personal struggles in order to become the single greatest pirate crew the East Blue has ever seen. Each with their own goals, dreams, and ambitions, only together can they achieve the impossible. And come hell or high water, as their captain once said, NOTHING'S GONNA STAND IN OUR WAY! One Piece is a large story, and one with many different arcs, plotlines, and characters, and this show had the Herculean task of trying to cram 100 manga chapters and 61 anime episodes into one 8 fucking episode first season. Forget about the casting, the visuals, and other elements of this adaptation that many fans were nervous about, the thing that had me the most concerned and curious about was whether or not they could actually tell the story without compromising what made the story good to begin with. Which is very difficult because this shit is weird. Due to its over-the-top goofiness and comedic sensibilities, One Piece has always been something of a polarizing title despite being arguably the best of the big three, or big seven as of the moment of writing the script. This anime wasn't, isn't, and will never be afraid to be as ridiculous as possible for the sake of being the fun and entertaining story that it is. Don't believe me? Luffy literally just brought down a giant fucking dragon using the logic of Hanna-Barbera cartoons, which I will begin to demonstrate using these action figures. Take that, Kaido. <laughs> oh yeah. I forgot. I couldn't buy the action figures because SOMEBODY decided to hack my information and steal $300 off my bank account. Thanks whoever turned the channel's Facebook into a bra shopping group! I am talking scorched earth, motherfucker! I will massacre you! I will fuck you up! Anyway, One Piece is weird. No argument there. So you would think, given Hollywood's track record of live-action adaptations of popular anime, that this was the one that was predetermined to fail just on concept alone. I mean, we live in a world where one of the easiest anime to adapt into live-action, created by the same studio responsible for this one ironically enough, was received so poorly by critics and audiences alike that it got shit-canned after only one season, one month after releasing. Cowboy Bebop was supposed to be the adaptation to end the so-called live-action curse when it comes to anime. I say that because there have been a number of pretty good adaptations over the years, but no one is prepared to have that conversation surprisingly enough. If Cowboy Bebop however couldn't work in live-action, then what the hell are the chances for fucking One Piece to succeed? It's a Looney Tunes cartoon of pirates with superpowers, broad comedy, and a shit ton of fan service. How the hell are they going to pull this off after feeling horribly with what was arguably the simplest anime they could have fucking adapted? Give me cancer now, guy! <laughs> the odds were all against it from the beginning, even despite the fact that manga creator Eiichiro Oda was supposedly involved with the series. And then, something incredible happened. The series got its first official teaser trailer during the Netflix 2 event, where the cast of the show had the chance to introduce themselves to a jury of their peers as they premiered the very first look into the series. This was their first and last chance to convince an incredibly hard to please audience of fans worldwide that their favorite manga of all time can work in live action. It is not an exaggeration when I say that the series was going to live and die off of the strength of this first impression. Which may seem unfair to some, but you gotta remember, we've been here before and the results... Oh yes, a dream, I like that. ...haven't always been the best. Now that's not to say that there wasn't some level of optimism to be had here. Many fans and even a few content creators like Jeff Thu of Mother Spaceman actually expressed a cautiously optimistic response to the announcement especially after the cast was announced, leading many to suspect that Netflix was actually cooking up something special. There was some legitimately good will brewing amidst the inevitable chaotic response that the internet would surely have towards this adaptation and any and all changes made towards it. 
So this moment here in Tudum where we see the cast responding to a crowd of loud and enthusiastic Brazilian fans was going to be the be all end all for this series before it could even release in the months to come. And then the teaser was shown and whatever negative discourse existed before that was mysteriously replaced with rapturous overwhelming praise. You serious? Okay, that may be a little bit hyperbolic, but this is probably the first time that a live-action anime adaptation was being received with mostly a positive reception. The casting decisions, the cinematography, the practical effects, the production design, the color scheme, even the music. The fucking music! Jesus Christ! Everything about this teaser just oozed positivity in a way that a Netflix series hasn't done before. Granted, the buzz wasn't always positive, as some criticisms were given to some of the dialogue choices, I'm sensing a little bit of tension amongst the crew, not, not a, crew. a crew, and some still felt a bit unsure about the CGI and overall direction of the story. However, all of those critiques were later swayed the other direction when One Piece Day revealed the official first trailer which showcased a lot more footage, including some additional cast members, which also included a first look at one of the big villains for the show, Arlong the Saw. Arlong was the one character I was the most nervous about when this series was being developed for very obvious reasons that you can see here. He is this 9 foot tall intimidating motherfucker of a villain who you hate with every fiber of your being and look forward to seeing get his comeuppance at the end. I was so scared that with the amount of CG that would go into bring the devil fruit powers to life, Arlong would end up a casualty in the same vein as post season 2 of The Flash. But imagine my fucking surprise when he appears on screen for the first time and not only does he look incredible, he's also entirely fucking practical. I'll do you the kindness of killing you all together. It was also during One Piece Day where they would announce that, for fans of the original anime, the cast would be dubbed over in Japanese by the original cast of the One Piece anime. <laughs> The hype has officially grown strong for what was now being happily called One Piece Live Action by fans, or OPLA, and many began expressing their excitement for the upcoming show in many different ways. My excitement for this show, for example, began on TikTok of all fucking places, when Netflix began to post little promos featuring the cast talking about the series. My favorite one was the one where Luffy's actor, Iñaki Godoy, got to explain what One Piece was to a Spanish audience in fucking Espanol. Hola, y bienvenidos a bordo. Soy Iñaki Godoy, y estoy muy emocionado de interpretar a Luffy en One Piece. Quiero contarles un poco sobre este mundo épico para prepararlos para la nueva serie de Netflix. You can tell he was just so proud of everything he worked on with this series and knowing that Luffy was played by a Hispanic actor hit very close to home for me personally, especially since Luffy is canonically Hispanic as well, albeit their nationalities are a little different. Another favorite of mine is where the cast tried to explain how to properly pronounce Luffy's name. This at first looked kinda ridiculous, but then I remember a lot of fans watched this series in Japanese and pronounced Luffy's name with an R as a result, which instantly made this video all the more hilarious. It also introduced me to my other reason for watching this series when it first came out. Animated or not, Nami is still best girl. Until season 2 comes out and Vivi gets introduced. Sorry Nami. As you can see, I had a lot of positive vibes for this series and I couldn't wait for the show to come out as I was struggling with my personal life. It felt like a goal I could reach just by waiting a little longer and struggling just a little more. It'll all be over soon, August 31st was almost here. Then August 31st came and went and the world waited with bated breath for that goddamn Rotten Tomato score. Me personally, I was nervous for this as well, but my nerves were overwhelmed by the fact that the fucking show was finally available for streaming, and on 3 o'clock in the goddamn morning, I began streaming the first episode, and continued watching it until it was time to sleep so I can go to work. Then I finished the last four episodes once work had ended, and when I tell you that this show left me crying my fucking eyes out, I fucking mean it. I ended up crying over six times in different parts of different episodes. Some of these moments I was prepared for. 
others I was just not expecting them to hit me as hard here as they did in the anime or the manga. But one thing One Piece has over me that almost no other show does is that I cannot personally talk about certain moments or even watch certain moments without getting emotional and feel my eyes begin to swell up with tears. One Piece is a triumph. It's the gold standard for which other adaptations should use as an example. But how? How did One Piece succeed where Cowboy Bebop failed? What's the secret? How did it do it? Well, that's why I'm making this video. So let's talk about this show and see what was it about the One Piece live action that worked so well. Honestly, this show is kind of a miracle when you get around to it. It seems that despite this being handled by one of the scummiest businesses on the streaming industry, every right person was in charge of seemingly every important factor needed to make this show work. From the incredible cast to the showrunners Steven Maeda and Naruto Turbo fan Matt Owens, to the costume and makeup department and especially to the special effects department who gave 110% at bringing the impossible visuals of this world to light. Oh, and before I say anything about the production of the show, I need to give a special shout out to the real heroes of this series, the music composing duo Sonia Belasova and Gioana Ostinelli, whom I hope to Christ I pronounced correctly and if I didn't I am so sorry. The duo wrote a total of 79 goddamn tracks for this series, using many different instruments and incorporating many elements of music to tell the story as each episode progresses. Each character has an incredible leitmotif that says so much without needing to say any words and I'm honestly blown away at the outside the box perspective for some of the songs that were done. I wish I knew more about music to properly convey what it is about it that makes it so good, but I'm gonna leave it at just three things. The fight between Zoro and Mihawk has this incredible Spanish feel to it that gives me the feeling of an old Robert Rodriguez movie. Somebody out there thought that it was a great idea to give Arlong and his pirates their own hip hop and rap number, and we're very right to do so. And they even bring in Aurora to provide vocals for one of the songs to serve as Nami's theme. One that brings out all the heartbreak and melancholy that goes with the character and her story. The entire soundtrack for this show is unbelievable. It's incredible that it's so good that it manages to overshadow the music in the actual anime. In fact, you're listening to that music right now. Awesome, isn't it? I may not understand a lot when it comes to music. It's honestly why I wish somebody like Sideways or Musical Hell could cover that department for me since they're much more knowledgeable about this than I am. But One Piece has always been known for having a distinct soundtrack compared to the big three of old. So it makes sense that its live action success would follow the tradition of having some of the greatest music ever heard. Even using music from the anime like Bing Sake or the very first opening song, We Are. Proven that you can still pay respect to the original while also putting your own stamp of creativity in existing work. Isn't that right, Jello Apocalypse? <laughs> Topical. So, there honestly seems like no reason why the show wouldn't have been successful right out of the bat. But like I said, the road to its release was not an easy one for the series to trek through. I already briefly talked about this a minute ago, but it bears to be repeated. One Piece had to undergo several different hurdles in order to come out as a successful live action series. Many of which unfortunately had to do with the many, 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 many failed attempts to bridge the gap between animation and live action when it comes to anime in the West. One Piece had the disadvantage of being birthed into a world already predestined to hate it before any kind of production could even start. While I personally think most of that hate is just fanboy riddled dick writing, as it turns out to be 90% of the time, a lot of warranted skepticism was still there regarding the type of story it was adapting, the studio that was involved, and the material that was made beforehand. Needless to say, Netflix does not have a good track record when it comes to successful live action anime adaptations. And bear in mind, they have already adapted two, two of the easiest anime in the world to pull off in live action. One of which was already successful in Japan in live action. So here's Netflix, the company responsible for turning Cowboy Bebop into a shell of its former self, along with permanently turning Death Note into a bigger punchline than even the end of the anime itself ever could. Trying to convince 
convinced and already unconvinced and cynical world, hey, we can bring One Piece, one of the most heavily cartoonish, impossible to adapt, larger than life stories of all time, to life as a live action adaptation. <sighs> yeah, people were pushing X for doubt faster than any quick time event in video game history. No shit! Me personally, I heard about the news of a live action One Piece years ago, and I just sort of not cared because I genuinely was not that much of a fan at the time. I owned 5 DVD sets at the time, and I honestly still do. I liked what I saw, though at the time I never really got past the Baratie arc because it dragged on for me personally, and as such I could never consider myself a fan of the show. Not because I hated it, I just haven't seen enough of it to convince me it's worth getting into. And before you ask, yes, like many of you, I was introduced to this series back when Toonami aired that ridiculous dub courtesy of 4 kids which, if I can be honest, ridiculous censorship aside, you all hate that dub way more than you should. All of this was years ago though. My feelings about how I felt about One Piece have changed drastically over the next few years, but I still didn't feel like giving this my attention. Mostly because, and I hate to say it, I really didn't want to be dragged down whatever angry discourse this show was going to have with live action versus animation. Not again after the last hundred times. I've already had my mind scrambled and my day ruined multiple times by people who feel the need to crusade against live action Disney remakes or reboots of any kind in general, even when they're just adaptations that were never remakes of any kind. But people keep using the word as a way of generating easy angry clicks. Looking at you, Screen Rant. I was sick of that shit when the live action Beauty and the Beast movie came out, and I am still sick of that shit today, even when it's for a movie I genuinely think isn't good. So you can imagine I was not prepared to put up with any purist fan whining and complaining about every minute detail changed while unfairly comparing it to the original as fans are often known for doing while replacing honest criticism with blinded nostalgia over what they consider to be the superior product. And don't get me started on angry racists claiming to be fans of anything when all they're doing is making money by complaining every time they cast a Hispanic actor to play a Hispanic character, or a black actor to play a black character, or in the unlikely possibility, a video game asking you to provide pronouns. Looking at you, Ryan, Jeremy, Gary, and the fucking pronouns guy. Say the line. Fucking pronouns. Yeah. Uh, let me be clear. I don't care in the slightest if people have opinions about any show or movie, good or bad, and they feel the need to express. I simply feel like much of these opinions tend to focus on the wrong thing and or tend to be done so in bad faith. And it often becomes easier to see than it should to be perfectly honest. Obviously this doesn't speak for everyone, but the loudest minority are often the most irritating and I maintain this mentality all throughout the build up to the reveal of the first teaser of One Piece. And honestly, I just felt burnt out by the perpetual state of idiocy that media discourse was headed towards. I've seen it all before. Many, 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 many goddamn times. <sighs> and then, something insane happened. The internet was not fucking stupid for a change. Yeah, so, so we got some different opinions in chat. Some people saying they died from cringe. I don't know. I think that they got the tone just right between keeping it too serious and, and keeping it, like, too cartoony. It's like little things like that, like Luffy sitting crisscross on Mary's head that, that show it's a passion project. Baratier looks absolutely beautiful. No. Okay, that's kind of clean. I'm I, not gonna I don't lie, hate it, bro. I, I don't hate it. This I'm not mad at it. Stretching was gonna be Shut up. August 31st. What? Dude. Honestly speaking, and this is like throwing away all biases and all the little nitpicks that I was mentioning in this video. This actually looks not that bad. But we'd make a pretty good team. Okay, it looks kind of hot though. <laughs> but this is not... Oh God. What the hell is going on? This is... Actually, I, I'm not even being hyperbolic for the sake of a joke here. I, I genuinely expected the usual suspects to tear this shit up. Now I have a new usual suspects who did tear this shit up and everybody was clowning on them for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> the tide was shifting in ways even I didn't expect to see. While there was still plenty of cautious optimism, many fans, including some who weren't even fans of the anime or the manga, 
were beginning to show excitement for the show as more and more information became available. Which, given that the show was being released in the middle of the WGA and SAG after strike, meant that most of the promotion became heavy lifting for fans old and new to spread the word about the show and its inevitable release on August 31st. Even Jeff Thu of all people was losing his shit over it. It's a news coup! It's a news coup! News coup! The excitement was building up and the antics of the cast became infectious as fans began to discover more about who was going to be portraying the Straw Hat Pirates on the screen. Some were relatively new faces while others were already making names for themselves for years. But was all of that excitement warranted? Well, batten down the hatches, raise the anchor, and let's find out. Sebastian, enough of the puns, man. They're starting to get really old. Oh, come on, they're funny. No, they're fucking not. So first off, holy shit, we gotta talk about the production design on this show. By this point, I've been so used to seeing anime live action adaptations overuse green screen effects to the point where nothing feels real or tangible. So I usually tend to be more forgiving for visual effects such as these, especially when they require you to imagine things that cannot possibly exist in the real world. But as technology advances, some studios have begun to get lazy to the point that there's no need for sets, props, or even costumes. Why bother? Everything can just be digitally altered and it will look fantastic and totally not distracting. Isn't that right, George Reeves and Christopher Reeve? I cannot emphasize enough just how appreciative I am to know that the world of One Piece was brought to life with a budget reserved for something like Game of What the Fuck is This? And yet, apart from the Devil Fruit powers, which all look amazing despite the obvious use of CG, for the most part, every location, set, and even the goddamn ships themselves were all practical! Even some of the props were practical, like the goddamn transponder snails, which I didn't even think were going to be added into the show, and using animatronics and puppetry of all things to bring them to life. They even gave one personally to Eichiro Oda himself. Also, notice how it said transponder snail. Notice also how they kept them exactly as they were in the source material. This is yet another thing that surprised the hell out of me when it came to the show itself. Stop me if you heard this one. A popular source material gets adapted into a movie or TV series, but loses all of the appeal it had in favor of a more drab, easily marketable, and realistic aesthetic out of fear of alienating a wide market believing that what made the source material good and popular to begin with was simply not going to translate well with mainstream audiences. You actually go outside in these things? What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? <laughs> yeah, I know what you're thinking. But Sebastian, the popularity of the MCU studios are becoming much more lenient when it comes to stealing and ridiculous stuff in comics. Yes, well, Spider-Man and Iron Man this is not. One Piece by design is over the top, goofy, and ridiculous since the first few panels of the manga. I say this because, let's be honest, it is not unlikely for a company like Netflix to completely overhaul the source material to make it more dark, gritty, realistic, at the cost of removing the heart and joy that was missing from the anime and manga, and the worst part is, at least for this instance, I can't honestly blame them. What? I completely detest the act of taking an existing source material known for being bright, colorful, or fun and adapting it in a way that completely removes all of the bright and color from it in order to try to recapture the success of something like The Dark Knight. At the same time, I get the hesitancy in trying to adapt something this over the top and crazy into live action because of the possibility of it being rejected by mainstream audiences. Not everything works on live action and not everything is as easy to adapt as something like Batman or Spider-Man. Even the live action One Piece had to undergo some level of compromise. However, that goes without saying that if you're not confident that the source material will be able to speak for itself without you basically changing everything about it apart from the title, names, and other trivial aspects, then maybe you shouldn't be adapting said property in the first place if you don't believe it can succeed on its own. Even if the end product can occasionally result in something decent or good. I know it sounds like I'm stating the fucking obvious when I say all of that, but this wasn't even something I had in mind. Eichiro Oda himself was hesitant in adapting the manga into live action, only changing his mind when he saw Steven Child's Shaolin Sucker and realized that times were changing and that the technology was there to help bring this story to life. The fact that he needed to be convinced to do so because of how big and over the top his own story was goes to show just how hesitant many are when it comes to properties like this one. 
Thankfully, not only was Oda Sensei heavily involved with the show as mentioned earlier, he also had the final go when it came to any and all changes, ideas, and casting decisions. Nothing could go without his approval, and as the guy who's responsible for the most popular and best-selling manga of all time, it kinda goes without saying that he knew what he was doing when he allowed many of the creative choices in the show, especially when it came to the casting. I mean this with zero exaggeration when I say that literally every casting decision done for this show is astounding. From the supporting characters, to those who barely had a chance to shine in this part of the story, to surprising additions and even characters who were only name dropped and never appeared in the story on account of being dead. Kobe, Helmeppo, Axe Hand Morgan, Buggy, Shanks, Mihawk, even characters who weren't originally shown in this arc in the original like Garp, Dragon, or... Wait... Is that fucking Crocodile? Shit. <laughs> well, I'm fucking dead. Okay, while I sit and wait for Baroque Works to kill my ass, let's actually talk about the show itself and what is it about it that actually works. Let's break down the first and most important aspect of the show when comparing it to the original source, the runtime. One Piece Live Action was released as an 8 episode first season because Netflix, in their infinite wisdom, are still trying to follow the Stranger Things business model, which has universally only worked with Stranger Things and nothing fucking else. Like I said before, this part of the story covers 100 chapters of the manga and 61 episodes of the anime. I don't care how big your budget is and how many dedicated hands you have working on your show. You cannot tell a story that big and bloated without compromises down the road. And I present to you, compromises down the road. The way they went about doing the adaptation in terms of story structure is actually pretty unique, in the sense that they used those 8 episodes that Netflix inexplicably mandated and had 2 episodes dedicated to each particular member of the Straw Hat Pirates. Episodes 1 and 2 were focused on Luffy, 3 and 4 were focused on Zoro, 5 and 6 were focused on Sanji, and 7 and 8 were focused on Best Girl. Structurally speaking, each character gets their own personal two-episode arc where we get to explore their backstory and reasons for why they want to sail to the Grand Line in the first place. Now, you'll notice how I only mentioned four of the Straw Hat Pirates getting their own two-episode arc. Two episodes each, eight episodes total. If you do the math, something seems to be missing. Oh yeah, what about Usa? The two-episode arc idea is fantastic and it honestly helps to perfectly condense these characters and their stories in a way that was quicker to show but didn't take away from the impact that their lives had in the story. All except for Usopp, my boy, who has to share his two-episode arc with Zoro while only having episode 3 to serve as his entire character arc while episode 4 focuses on Zoro seeing his rival Kuina dying from an unfortunate disagreement with the stairs. This is where the 8 episode mandate really starts to show its ugly head and begins to cause problems for how to tell the story. I don't mind condensing, structuring, or even outright omitting certain parts or characters to tell your story, as not everything needs to be adapted so to speak. But it becomes increasingly clear that when given a strict episode limit, compromises like these, however good they may turn out at the end, can and has resulted in creativity being stunted or limited, which for a show like One Piece is something that you should never fucking do. With all of that being said though, I personally feel like the live action did something... Okay, I know I'm gonna get a lot of flack for saying this, but I stand by it so get your torches and pitchforks ready cause here it comes. One Piece live action adapted the East Blue Saga better than the anime ever did. I mean it, for as much as I love the East Blue Saga of One Piece and how much I enjoy the anime for all that it is, I cannot deny that One Piece's biggest weakness as a story is that Toei Animation has a huge fucking problem when it comes to pacing. This isn't even exclusively to just One Piece, Majinger Z. Digimon, Sailor Moon, Slam Dunk, and of course, the crown jewel of them all, Dragon Ball Z. Five minutes. That's how long you have. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now. That's a complete fucking lie. All fantastic anime, and some that I love and worship almost if not more than One Piece itself, yet they all suffer from the same problem. 
Towing animations issues with pacing feel like a failsafe in order to be able to always stay on track with the manga to avoid a fruits basket or full metal alchemist type of situation where the anime over adapts the story to the point that it has to wait for the manga to catch up. It's why it took 4 years for Attack on Titan to finally get a second season after the anime debuted in 2013. Understandable though that reasoning may be, the double-edged sword with that mentality is that it causes storylines and subplots to drag on or blow up to the point of making a story that's relatively long already feel even longer by comparison. It's because of this reason that I consider the live action adaptation of the East Blue Saga better than the anime, because the live action is an easier and more appropriate way of recommending One Piece to newcomers who aren't interested in reading the manga. I also really appreciate some of the fun additions that they added to the live action series, however controversial they may be to hardcore One Piece fans. I really cannot emphasize how much I love Vincent Reagan's garb. He somehow manages to walk the fine line between self-restraint and over-the-top lunacy with his performance in a way that made me feel like he was trying to channel either Michael Shannon or Willem Dafoe. His back and forth with Kobe, who undergoes his own personal arc throughout the story, is also great to see, and the relationship that they developed as mentor and apprentice just adds more to the story in ways that even the anime ever managed to do up until this point. Speaking of Kobe, hot damn, who knew the kid from Evil Dead Rise would go from fighting deadites to fighting pirates? Forget about the main cast for one second, Morgan Davies is Kobe in both appearance and personality, and is such a beautiful beacon of good in a corrupt and broken system like the world government. Plus, his relationship with his now best friend Helmeppo is just amazing. Every scene these two idiots spend together is just as entertaining here as it was in the anime. Also, Aiden Scott is just the perfect Helmeppo. He manages to have the most punchable face on the planet next to Hangman from Top Gun Maverick, and his voice, laugh, and mannerisms make him just the perfect foil for Kobe to banter with throughout the story. But I need to ask, and I'm not technically complaining about this, I was more pleasantly surprised than anything else, and uh, honestly I kinda had a bigger laugh about this than I should, but I still really need to ask. Was it necessary to have him bare-assing around with Zoro's swords? Well, there's the fan service One Piece is famous for, and honestly, it's more nudity than the anime ever gets to show, unfortunately. Oh shut up you horny idiot! Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. For as much as I sit here and talk about some of my favorite heroes, however, we have to talk about the fucking villains. Axe Hand Morgan, Buggy the Dreamboat, Captain Kuro, and briefly sharing the screen with Stephen John Ward's Mihawk, it's Don Krieg for about three minutes. Such a disappointing final gambit. Honestly, with how long that fight dragged in the manga, this is fine with me. However, we need to talk about Arlong once again and how fucking phenomenal McKinley Belcher III was in the role. Arlong is a fishman who happens to be one of the deadliest pirates in all of the East Blue, and is one that holds power as one of the few pirates that the world government refuses to prosecute due to the financial incentives that he provides given his rule. He may not be one of the seven warlords of the sea, but he sure as shit acts and feels like one. Arlong is one of the cruelest and most unforgivable pieces of shit I've ever seen in all of animation, and one I was honestly kind of nervous to be seen portrayed on screen because of people's tendency to be disgusting assholes who attack actors who did absolutely nothing wrong except to act. Looking at you Star Wars fans, fuck all of you with a 10 foot pole. This thankfully did not happen as far as we know, and instead we got to see Arlong be as much of a ferocious asshole in live action as he was in the anime. Also worth mentioning, Arlong isn't just played by a wonderful black actor, he's also very much black coated within the show, which is one particular thing that One Piece has always been famous for, its diverse and inclusive cast of characters. One Piece, despite it being very much a shonen manga, manages to show more positive representation in it than most other western works do today. And yes, one Piece is an LGBTQ positive story as any fan of both Ban Clay and Yamato, just to name a few, will tell you. The diversity is also very much seen with the cast of the live action series as well, given that the aforementioned Morgan Davies is also trans himself. 
One Piece doesn't need to highlight or spotlight LGBT characters because it feels that simply letting them exist and being who and what they are is more than enough. And seeing the live action show continue that perspective and seeing the overwhelming love and praise that Morgan got for his portrayal as Kobe by millions of fans everywhere once again goes to show just how quote unquote woke One Piece truly is. Well. Now that I managed to actually speak up with some of my critiques and favorite casting decisions, totally not as a last minute addition due to a hasty script rewrite in the middle of a power outage at work, I believe it's as good a time as any to talk about the crew of the going merry before any warlords come knocking on my door. Let's start with everyone's favorite directionless swordsman, Roa Noah Zoro. Does it come with a free face tattoo? My favorite is number one. The Muscle, the first mate. If anyone can be considered the co-captain of the Goi Mary, it would be Luffy's second in command. Zoro is easily one of the most badass people in the entirety of the world of One Piece, and one who never leads a clean path wherever he goes. Why? Because they're always filled with corpses. Jesus. Zoro is played by real-life badass anime character McKinyu who is no stranger to live-action anime adaptations, having played Scar in the sequel to the live-action Full Metal Alchemist movie, fuck you Vic Mignogna, Yuki Shiro Enishi in the live-action Rironi Kenshin movies, fuck you Nobuhiro Watsuki, and just this year he played Seiya in the live-action Knights of the Zodiac movie that nobody remembers, just to name a few. Fuck you Sony. He's also an exceptionally skilled martial artist, and unlike most of the cast, actually did the majority of his own stunts. Even the ones that leave him bending his swords up. Oops. McKinney has stated that when he was offered a role for the live-action One Piece that Zoro was the one character he wanted to play. He's been a fan of the manga and anime more so than the rest of the cast, except maybe Emily Rudd, but phew, no, because she's such a beautiful dork, but more on her later. McKinney brings a level of charm and coolness to the character in a way that allows him to truly embody Zoro perfectly while also allowing for his Zoro to stand out on his own. McKinney was born to either be a swordsman or an actor. And here he gets to be both. Not surprising seeing as his father was the late Sonny Chiba. McKinyu fought and clawed his way to the top and became an icon much like his father before him. Hint, hint. It always leads back to Dear Evan Hansen for me, doesn't it? Wait a minute. Oh my god. Oh my god. All of the hackings. My money been stolen. All the depression that I've been putting up with. It wasn't a bunch of assholes who decided to hack my stuff after I accidentally downloaded a Trojan virus off the internet. It was all done by him. The perpetrator for me losing all of my sanity and half of my money. The one responsible for all of this. It was right there in front of me this entire goddamn time. Evan Hansen! Or I just... Got unlucky and downloaded a really stupid crack that had a Trojan in it. Don't download cracks off the internet, kids. Don't be doing. Don't do the same mistake that I did. You are pathetic. Anyways. The great Captain Usopp fails another notorious villain. The brave Captain Usopp, the sharpshooter, the shipwright, the cowardly lion who's had courage all along. In the anime, Usopp was the character I identified the most with because of his sharp tongue, love of storytelling, and his ability to stay alive despite the crippling fear of death at every corner. He is, without question, my favorite straw hat in the anime and in the manga. At least until Water 7 happens and all of that shit goes out the window. Usopp was played by Jacob Romero Gibson who delivered his Usopp with the kind of riz that manga and anime Usopp wish they had. Despite the riz, he's still the same lovable goofball who's never afraid to stretch the truth in order to tell a great story even if no one is around to hear it. <laughs> and no one's around to see it. It also goes without saying that out of any of the characters portrayed on this show, Usopp was one of the ones who deserved a redesign more than anybody, as the whole long-nosed Pinocchio theme of the original manga and anime, and I say this as someone who enjoys superhero movies, would have looked unbelievably stupid and distracting. The point of an adaptation isn't to copy the original, but rather to translate the original, and Usopp's character design thankfully didn't get lost in translation. Besides, long nose or not, Usopp is still Usopp and Usopp fucking rules. Now ladies and gentlemen, what do you say we spice things up up in here? Let's talk fan service. Come on, with my horny pansexual ass, who did you think I was gonna cut to? Neither Vivi nor Toshigi have appeared on the show yet, after all. 
Are you asking me to dance? Because I've kind of had my arm on that blunder table eight. But can we? We already had a date, dude. You can't just flake on me like this. Sanji, the cook, the playboy, the leg muscle. <laughs> You were serious about that? If anyone is keeping the Straw Hat crew alive with a balanced diet, it's definitely him. Provided Luffy doesn't eat the goddamn protein. How many times? Luffy, this always ends the same way. You never learn, do you? Sanji is one of the slickest and most popular characters in the original manga, and also one of the most controversial characters as well. I am now prepared to sail to the ends of the earth as a pirate if it means someone of your rare beauty will be by my side! Yeah, it was no surprise that if any character was gonna be either toned down or reduced significantly, it was gonna be the only Straw Hat member who had canonically almost died from excessive bloodlust from being in an island filled with beautiful women. And don't even get me started on that time Nami turned into a child. FBI, open up! <laughs> God. Sanji is played by the beautiful Tass Skyler in a role that absolutely felt the easiest for any of the cast and crew to pull off, yet he made it his life's mission to not simply act like Sanji. No, 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 no. That motherfucker is Sanji. That motherfucker is real. Not only did he train his body to be as athletic as Sanji, not only did he train himself to kick in various ways, incorporating Sanji's signature style of combat, where he uses his legs in order to not damage his hands, being a cook and all, Skylar went through the trouble of also learning how to cook, and did so religiously. What do I mean by religiously? Homeboy cooked for the Straw Hat crew while they were on break. And according to popular opinion, his food is delicious. Don't believe me? Listen to this wonderful letter of endorsement. Hey guys, what's up? It's me, Inyaki, and today I will be reviewing Taz Scholar's food. Let's see. Oh, my gosh. It's, 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 it's great. Uh, <laughs> you did a good job. Between you and me, that critic might be a tad biased. It's also ironic because, apart from Usopp, he was also the character that got the most negative attention from his weight after the teaser trailer dropped. All because he didn't have the stupid little swirly eyelash that Sanji has in the manga. To which I say... I grew up with Sanji sucking on a lollipop and talking with a Brooklyn accent. You have no right to complain about unnecessary character changes, especially when this was the style of the time. Giving us the hard sell, huh? Hey, love a girl who treats me like dirt. Moreover, Tass Skyler, like another cast member we'll get to, is also bilingual and dropped his sexy voice in both the English version, the Latin American Spanish dub, and even the European Spanish dub, which garnered him praise and unnecessary criticism because of his accent. As somebody who can speak both English and Spanish fluently, and who's seen this show in every language available, I can absolutely validate that he can nail Sanji in both languages with ease in the same way that I can nail his Sanji with ease with- Oh, I shut I up. Plus, even with all the changes done to make his character less cancelable, he's still a raging simp here too, only here he's less, I'm calling the police, he's being creepy and more... You are pathetic. Every time he's hitting a Nami. Speaking of Nami... Nami. The navigator, the cat burglar, the one responsible for making sure that the going merry reaches its destination. How beautifully fitting that the one who lost sight of her path in this world be the one to guide everyone towards their destination. Nami is arguably the most broken member of the Straw Hat crew, having lost her mother at a young age and forcing herself to work with her abuser and kidnapper her entire childhood just to be able to help free her village from his grip. She trusts no one and keeps her feelings close to her chest. Nami's story is easily the most heartbreaking part of the entirety of the East Blue Saga as well as one of the saddest in the entirety of the One Piece mythos. And she is a character with many layers to her that would have required someone who understands the character and the story better than anyone else to play her on screen. So what did they do? They hired a fucking weeb. Emily Rudd is to the cast of One Piece what Iman Vellani is to the MCU. She's not only a talented actress, having just cut her teeth with the second Fear Street movie with Netflix, but she's also a massive dweeb. 
recommending anime to her cast members, being a fan of Jujutsu Kaisen, and honestly, she could really probably do a really sexy look in Nobara Kuchisaki cosplay, but that's just me being horny. Oh, shut up, you horny idiot! And of course, being the only one apart from Makenyu to be a huge fan of One Piece, to the point of being the only one who was aware of the fact that Yamato goes by male pronouns. Yes, you heard me right, male pronouns. And if you have a problem with that, take it up with my ass because it's the only one who gives a shit. Emily loved Nami and her story, saying that while she was nervous about it, it was still her dream to play the character after watching that moment which we will be talking about later, and fell in love with the series as a whole. Not that I can blame her. Nami is a character with a broken heart and a fake smile that she uses to hide her pain and feelings away. She is without a doubt one of the most complex characters in the entirety of the East Blue Saga. It's very easy to let yourself get distracted by her beauty and greed, but once you see behind it all, you discover that the real Nami is just a sad girl looking for a family she can belong to. A family in the unlikeliest of places. It's really no wonder that so many One Piece fans became fans in the first place. One Piece started off as a typical shonen manga and anime with a lot of fun and silly moments to it, and it was only after we got to know Nami even more that most of us realized that this story had more to say underneath the Devil Fruits action scenes and wonderful music. Of course, Nami isn't the only one who had to carry this series on her back with her emotional story. She may be the navigator of the Golden Mary, but what good is a pirate ship without a captain brave and stupid enough to set sail with no compass and no direction? Así que, damas y caballeros, niños y niñas, pendejos y pendejas igual, namacas de todos lados, menos todos que votaron por Pierluisi o Jennifer González, hablemos sobre nuestro capitán, Monkey D. Luffy. Who's that for? You being dumb. Monkey D. Luffy the captain, the dreamer, and the heart of the Straw Hat crew. He might not be the brightest, but his heart is always in the right place and he's never shy from showing how much he cares for those around him, especially when it comes to food. Having been granted the powers of the gum gum fruit, he's a pirate who cannot swim, making the very seas he wishes to travel across to get to the Grand Line the biggest hurdle for a guy like him. Is that gonna stop him? Nope, not until he fulfills his dream of becoming the king of the pirates. Out of Everyone in the Straw Hat crew, Zoro, Usopp, Sanji, Nami, not a single one of them proved to be a bigger challenge to cast than it was for Luffy, whom by Netflix's own accord was the most difficult casting decision they've ever made. A decision, I failed to mention before, was not theirs to make alone. Eiichiro Oda wasn't just heavily involved in the series in terms of providing ideas and approving or disapproving of certain changes and omissions. Sorry Nami x Zoro shippers, it ain't happening. Like when it came to the English dub of the anime, Oda was also involved in the casting for the live action series, and Luffy was the character that both he and Netflix knew they had to get right otherwise this series would never work. Luffy is the heart of One Piece. He's dumb, but he's not stupid. Tough, but emotional. He's not some grinning badass who struts a big sword and calls himself cool. That's what we have Zoro for. He's a smiling doofus with stretchy powers who's not afraid to fight vicious pirates who piss him off for hurting his friends. I'm not gonna lie, Luffy is one of those characters in manga and anime that for the longest time I believe could never work or exist in live action. Even with the rise of the MCU, the failure of the DCEU, and other studios trying their hardest to appeal to comic fans everywhere, one important detail that often gets left behind when casting someone to play a beloved character is that it's not enough for them to simply look like the character. They have to embody the character in every identifiable aspect, from their behavior to their morals, otherwise the illusion shatters instantly and the end result is, at best, a mediocre portrayal, and at worst, cultural fucking vandalism. I almost feel sorry for Netflix in that regard. They've been tasked with what is essentially ripping the character straight out of the panels of the manga and putting him in a live action TV show that just could not work no matter how much money you throw at the screen. There have been stellar casting choices before, but for Luffy in this case, it would have had to be something akin to Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, Heath Ledger as the Joker, Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, Tom Holland, all three of them as Peter Parker, David Tennant and Matt Smith as the Doctor. Hell. Alan Richson as Jack Reacher, somebody who, for lack of a better term, feels like they were legitimately born to play this particular role. Well, Netflix did, at least with Luffy and Nami hilariously enough, what they and subsequently Disney Channel do best. 
they hired the first person they could find who was already on their payroll. Cue the Simpsons joke! We're looking for a hot new basis for our upcoming live action adaptation here. Anyone? In your kick on Emily Road, I'm looking in your direction! Knock it off. Not since Takeru Sato has a live action portrayal of a character felt like he just got pulled directly from the pages of the manga that they belong to. Inyaki Godoi embodies the heart, optimism, and joy that makes up a chunk of Luffy's character. His costume and hat look authentic, sure, if you ignore the shoes. The real question is, what are those? But there is so much to his portrayal that makes Inyaki's Luffy that much more iconic and unique. As I said before, the point of an adaptation isn't to copy the original but rather to translate the original. In this case, the cast and crew had to work together to find a voice for their characters in a way that allowed them to be faithful to their source while still standing on their own as a unique interpretation. Inyaki Godoy was not originally a fan of the anime or the manga, but you'd be forgiven for mistaking that today. I mean, Inyaki absorbed the role to the point of becoming obsessed with the manga and then he later watched the anime as a reference. Went fucking sailing for 90 days, he even got to meet Luffy's voice actor Mayumi Tanaka, the greatest endorsement he could have ever had gotten. Or rather, the second greatest endorsement. Oda chose Inyaki after he saw his audition tape and started laughing. Let that sink in. The Kid from the Imperfects, a show that I'm pretty sure none of you remember until they brought it up just now, who up until this moment was primarily known for appearing in telenovelas, just made one of the biggest names in all of manga laugh with his portrayal of the character he created so many years ago. Between this, meeting Luffy's original voice actor, touring through Toei Animation's offices, the million buried question remains. Was he able to live up to the impossible expectations that millions of fans everywhere had following his casting announcement? I'm Monkey D. Luffy. And I'm gonna be King of the Pirates! Yeah, that's my answer to that. The world of animation has given us characters and stories that defy the possibilities of what live action is capable of telling. Not because of the over-the-top visuals, the cartoony humor, or the ridiculous premises, most of the time, the most unbelievable part of these stories are the characters that embody them, and One Piece has no shortage of incredible characters that make an otherwise ridiculous story that much more complex and nuanced. This is about the time I should probably take my reviewer glasses off and just let out what made me truly lose it when it came to this show. I cannot recommend this series enough for anyone who hasn't seen it yet, and this is going to be your first introduction to the world of One Piece as a whole then consider this a spoiler warning for the last two episodes. You have been warned. Many fans of One Piece always ask themselves the same question when discussing the anime in conversation. What was it that made you a fan in the first place? I'm not talking about dumb technical stuff like the voice acting, animation, or humor. Those are all the basic essentials of what made this show what it is. I'm talking about what particular moment is it that made you a fan in the first place. Everyone is entitled to their opinion and everyone's differs depending on who you ask, and to be fair, this question can also apply to any property as it would bear the same result. One Piece has achieved over 1,100 plus episodes, more than 100 manga chapters, and has become the biggest manga of all time. But what was it that drew fans into it in the first place? While I can't speak on behalf of fans all around the world, I can tell you personally that while I enjoyed this series during its first few episodes, I never truly saw the appeal of this franchise apart from a few awesome fight sequences and over the top hilarity. There was just no meat in those bones, nothing to truly make me want to stay longer than these first 61 episodes. Even garbage like Naruto at least managed to provide some level of nuance behind the meandering it put its viewers through in the first 15 episodes ending with a fight with Sabuza. One Piece was an action adventure comedy. It didn't need any nuance. Or rather, it felt like it couldn't provide any. There was nothing in this series that would ever make it stand out as anything more than a dumb male power fantasy with nothing of substance or emotional stakes to get invested over. And then, we get to Arlong Park. And whatever judgment I had about One Piece as just a dumb shonen anime with little value completely vanished the second I got to this arc in the show. And it all started with her. Remember how I said that the anime only really got the show that was more nuanced than we gave credit for the second we got to know Nami a bit more? This is what I was referring to when I was talking about her just a few minutes ago. 
Nami was the broken soul of the Straw Hat Pirates, a victim of cruelty by the hands of one of the cruelest villains to ever sail the East Blue. Losing her mother, abandoning her adopted sister, and forcing herself to work with the man who abused, tortured, and ruined her childhood out of a selfless need to try and free her village from his rule. Nami became the very thing she hated more than anything else in the world in order to save the people she loved more than anything else in the world. Only for all of that hard work to be taken away by the very man who, by his own merit, vowed to never go back on a deal when it involves money. This then leads to what is honestly the moment that I believe every skeptic going into this show began to truly come to appreciate the series for what it is. Nami, in her most vulnerable, after having pushed away everyone she has come to know due to her inability to trust in others, after finally being brought to her lowest, stabbing herself in the one area of her body that Arlong claimed as proof of her loyalty, only to be stopped by Luffy, who looked at her without so much as a thing to say, as she yelled and screamed and cried for him to go away. Until she couldn't fight it anymore and she put her trust on the unlikeliest person in the world to do so. Nami's breaking point and the subsequent showdown in Arlong Park remains to this day one of the most memorable and emotional moments in all of One Piece's history. Hell, I'd say it's one of the most emotional moments in animation as a whole. One of the most gut-punching and tear-jerking moments where you start to truly understand who a character is after being with her for so long but still not really getting to know who they actually were in the first place. Nami isn't some beautiful cat burglar obsessed with treasure and money. She's a broken child trying to rescue her home after having everything taken away from her. I've been watching anime for more than two decades at this point, and in between that time, I've seen many of what anyone can call the most heartbreaking moments in all of animation. Mei's Hughes' funeral, the fall of Shiganshina, Sakura's final words, Kaori's letter to Kosei, Rengoku's last smile. <laughs> oh god damn it. what I do to myself? Y'all better actually like and subscribe after watching this, because I did not sit through these clips back to back just so that all of you can ignore it. And yet, this moment right here broke me harder than I ever expected for it to do so. During the production of the live action series, one of my biggest personal fears was whether or not they could or even would attempt to bring this moment from the series to life. I stand by the fact that if they were to screw this scene up more than any other, then the show would have been dead on arrival. Doesn't matter how good everything is, the cast, production, the music, all of it would have been in vain if the show could not live up to the emotional center of what made the original story so good in the first place. Emily Rudd was actually praised directly by Ejiro Oda himself, who called her acting perfect but with no actual direct reference as to what moment they were referring to. Her performance overall was definitely perfect, and she herself was humble enough to break down emotionally after finding out what Oda-san thought about her acting, but all of us knew collectively that this meant the show's biggest emotional weight was all riding on her shoulders. Inyaki carried the heart of the story, while Emily carried the soul. It is no coincidence that the biggest make it or break it moment involves the two during this pivotal scene within the end of the seventh episode, where much like the manga and anime before it, Nami, in her biggest moment of weakness, looks to Luffy with tears in her eyes and begs for the help she never thought she would get. Up until this point, the entirety of the live action series has been pretty faithful despite a couple of changes in the missions. And where, oh where, was the dancing lion? This, however, was not just a scene that they needed to get right, it was the scene that would absolutely make or destroy the show forever. In the same way that Luffy's casting would have damaged the show if they got it wrong, if they were to screw this scene up, there really was no saving this show no matter how good the rest of it was. So now the question remains, did their combined efforts actually succeed in a miracle? Well, see for yourself. <laughs> That's it. They did it. They absolutely did it. 
it didn't matter what changes they made to the source material, what order of events took place, whether or not Garp should even be in this much of the story when he doesn't even get introduced until way later in the beginning of Alabasta, whether or not we might never get to see the Usopp pirates, or whether or not Helmepo's nude scene was even necessary to the story. The point of an adaptation is to take an existing property and bring it to life in whatever medium you choose to do so, adding your own creative spin to it while also maintaining everything that made the property so good and memorable to begin with. One Piece Live Action made a lot of changes and compromises to tell the story it wanted to tell, but with the help of a lot of creative people behind the wheel, and with the blessing of the creator as well, they did it all without sacrificing the heart of what made this series so good to begin with. That heart and soul that made people clap for Usopp's courage, scream at Zoro's badassery, squeal at Sanji's cooking, cry for Nami's suffering, and smile for Luffy's determination. One Piece wasn't an impossible story to adapt because of the crazy visuals, the powers, the story, or the ever-expanding lore and world building. One Piece was an impossible story to adapt because the characters were too perfect to be taken out of the ink and paper that they belonged to. One Piece live action isn't just a great series, it's a miracle. It is without any question or hyperbole the greatest adaptation of any manga that I've ever seen, and one that managed to succeed despite all of the odds being stacked against it. There is no reason this show should have worked, and it defied those odds and became something incredibly special. This isn't just an adaptation, it's something bigger, something incredible, and something that I legitimately believe is responsible for me still being here after all the suffering I personally went through back in 2023, and I'm still going through right now. I can't give up so easily now after surviving this long again to see what they're capable of achieving with this series. I gotta keep living, and that's exactly what I intend to do. My sails are set, and now it's time for me to come back home and do what I love doing more than anything else in the world. 2024 is long, we've already had two months of bullshit to deal with, and my schedule might have gotten off track, but I've never been one to go into things without a backup plan. Bring it on, 2024. I'm not out of the woods quite yet. Take it away, Aurora! I can't believe they did it. I can't believe how the year turned out. It went from being an abysmal disaster that left me depressed and miserable to still depressed, but at least I was able to manage it slightly. One thing's for sure, I'm not giving up on my dreams just yet. But now that it's all over, what the hell can I do now that the year has ended and my energy has been restored? Mr. Sebastian? The hell? Are you Sebastian from Cinemageddon Reviews? It all depends on who's asking. If you are who you say you are, I've got something for you. Uh oh, you can't do it. I didn't need to see that. Relax, you're not my wife. The GoPro box? What's up with the GoPro? It was cheaper. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, but uh, what did an envelope have sufficed? Look, dude, we're already we're already this deep into the recording. And we're already, let's just end this and do your damn bit. All right, fine, jeez. What the hell am I supposed to do with this then? Okay. Oh, it said letter. Dear Sebastian, I told you you couldn't get rid of me that easily. Don't worry, I'm not coming back anytime soon. My time in the spotlight is over. Now it's your turn to fulfill your purpose and unlock your potential. In order to do that though, you need to think bigger much bigger. Consider this the first step on a long and winding road that you set for yourself a year ago. Sincerely yours, Soren. Soren, you're just never gonna let me live this shit down. Wait, what the hell is this?
Gabe, pack your bags. We're going on an adventure.